Hi, thank you for joining us today at this Fire Drill Friday teach-in. I have two young guests today, Katie Eater and B. Gallardo, and um, I'm going to give you their biographies. Um, Katie is 20 years old, and uh, she's the executive director of Future Coalition, built by youth activists for youth activists. Future Coalition is a network of youth-led organizations and youth organizers across the United States. As a major force in the youth climate movement, Future Coalition coordinates the U.S. Youth Climate Strike Coalition, the, the group that organizes the national campaigns for the climate strikes in the U.S. And she led the coordination of the historic climate strikes on September 20th, 2019, which turned out nearly one million young people in the United States and four million globally. Katie was recently named to Forbes 30 Under 30, and she's currently taking two gap years before starting at Stanford University in the fall of 2020. B. Gallardo is 18 years old, and she's from the Apache, Yaqui, Chichimeca, Purepecha nations. She is a community organizer for the SoCal International Indigenous Youth Council and is president of the Living Cultural Intertribal Student Collective Club at Pasadena City College. I'm really glad that you guys are here. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks so much for having us. Um, so you're the ED of the um, Future Coalition. Can you tell us a little bit about what you what you're working on? Yes, working towards? yes. So Future Coalition, um, as you mentioned, is a network of youth-led organizations and youth organizers across the country. So essentially, we work to provide a connective tissue between young people who are making change in their communities and then provide them resources that traditionally have only been available to adult-led organizing. Such as? Um, such as funding, um, web designers, graphic designers, oh, cool. um, lawyers, you, know, mm -hmm. you name it. Um, and uh, for climate specifically, we coordinate the Climate Strike Coalition which is the group of um, the core group of nine youth-led organizations that work nationally around climate, and then um, over 350 other organizations that support the climate strikes in the U.S. So that would be Sunrise. Uh, yeah. So the nine groups are Divested, uh, Fridays for Future USA, Earth Uprising USA, Earth Guardians, uh, Extinction Rebellion Youth U.S., the International Indigenous Youth Council, uh, Sunrise, um, U.S. Youth Climate Strike, and Zero Hour. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And, and uh, how about you? What, what are you working on in your organizations? So I think our uh, biggest thing right now is planning for Earth Day. Um, there's going to be a lot to come out of that. So we're trying to change it up a little bit. Um, traditionally, Earth Day is usually like a one time, like one day out of the year thing. Um, but we're trying to change it to like a four day thing, um, following the guidelines of like ceremony um, and just traditional ways of prayer. So. Mm -hmm. And why don't you remind people when that is, April? So that'll, the actual Earth Day is going to be um, the 22nd of, uh, which, April. of April, which is a Wednesday. Um, and then we're actually planning to start it the 21st, a day before, um, and kind of following the guidelines along of um, prayer for ourselves, prayer for the Earth, uh, prayer for our seven generations, and prayers for our community. That's why four days. Yes. Yeah. And this is nationwide. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as we're organizing, um, it's going to be in the Los Angeles sector. But, um, yeah, we're going to try to aim for globally. And the nationwide strike, the, like, the, the, the unification nationwide is three days. So it's April 22nd, April 23rd, and April 24th. Um, so three consecutive days of striking to, mm -hmm. to kick it up a notch in 2020. Yeah. Um, did this start with Greta? Uh, Thunberg or before Greta or what what was was Greta did she play any role in your organization well, maybe um, <laughs> did it start with Greta <laughs> um, personally I mean it didn't really start with Greta um, I didn't find out about her till later um, in high school um, I think my introduction into the climate movement was more towards um, our water protectors in 2016 um, with happened what happened at um, Standing Rock and um, 
just kind of really looking up to our elders in our community um, and how they've been fighting generationally. So, I mean, that's where it started in, in my case. I actually, I wouldn't have asked you about Greta because <laughs> I know that indigenous people have been protecting the earth and the forests for centuries, mm -hmm. in fact. Um, you know, I, I went to Standing Rock and I've, I've kind of been involved in, in um, indigenous movements since AIM back in the 70s. Um, I didn't realize until I started the Fire Drill Fridays in D.C. where we, ha we had a lot of indigenous leaders and speakers, people from frontline communities. I didn't realize the critical, central, strategic importance of indigenous people, not only globally, because we know about in Brazil and in Indonesia, but all over the United States, not just in the northern states like North Dakota with Standing Rock, but, but all over. You, you have been on the front lines fighting for so long, and I, I, and I, di I didn't realize uh, that, and I'm really, I'm really grateful because one of the things that I've learned is that it is indigenous peoples that hold the solutions for what we have to do. Not just right now in changing our relationship to nature, but in going forward. Every time I've talked to the indigenous um, speakers who came to Fire Drill Friday, they always not only talk about stopping fossil fuel, but what kind of society do we want to build in the future? There's a holistic approach to the problem that I find really moving. You're nodding. I think you've, you've had enough experience to know what I'm talking about, right? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think that, you know, we um, have, have learned a lot. I think the youth, the youth climate movement has learned a lot from, um, you know, I think indigenous people and I think also has learned a lot of lessons from watching the climate movement and the environmental movement over the last few decades. And, you know, there's been so many successes and so many wins and there's also been so many new challenges. And I think what it's made me realize and I think a lot of young people is that we can't we can't solve the issues by the same homogenized group that are are causing the issues. Um, and then, if we really want to create solutions that are equitable, that are centering justice, that are centering people on the planet, then we need to listen to those who who who, who know how to do that. Yeah. Um, which is, is is not old white men. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, yeah, I think that's it. Makes me really proud that the youth climate movement is, um, you know, so much more diverse in so many ways, yeah. um, and that we really are, you know, not just saying that we want to center frontline youth, indigenous youth, but that we're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and and we have a, a long way to go for sure, um, but um, I think we're definitely taking steps in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've been very impressed with that. And it doesn't just come from a place like it's the right thing to do. It's like, because we need right. those presences, those voices at the table in order to figure out how we get out of this situation. You know, it's a very strategic thing that's happening and, and I've been very impressed. Um, how did you get involved in the student climate strike? What, what started you off? So I first got involved or got interested in climate when I was in sixth grade um, and I read An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. Uh, and at that point in time, I, I um, you know, this was, I guess, 10 years ago now, um, that I was really kind of, I think I didn't understand how an issue could be so big and that we weren't addressing it. And I thought, oh, no one must know about this. You know, if we knew about it, we'd be doing something. Oh, that's how Greta um, felt, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so in sixth grade, on Earth Day, actually, when I was in sixth grade, I organized an assembly for my elementary school um, about climate change. And we talked about reduce, reuse, recycle, and gave everyone a reusable straw. Um, and, and I think it, I wanted to get more involved, but at that point there was really no support for youth activism, especially youth activism around climate, because it just didn't really exist. Um, and then, you know, I got, as I went through middle school and high school, got involved with other issues and, and social change things, and then I actually got much more involved in activism um, around gun violence in 2018 after the Parkland shooting and after the rise of the March for Lives movement. Um, and that was where the idea for Future Coalition came from, was sort of the rise of youth activism from the gun violence movement and the need for there to be really a space to foster collaboration and community. And then as the energy um, really moved into climate uh, in, the, in the U.S. and globally, a lot of the work Work that we have been doing around creating space for collaboration and creating space for community amongst youth organizers has shifted into climate. Um, and, and we're excited to yeah, keep the energy and, until the election and far beyond. Um, so it's been, it's been a journey okay. for sure. Why climate? 
I, I know what you're, but I want you to say it. Yes. Um, well, climate is the, you know, the existential issue of our time. It is the most important social issue that no other social issue will matter if we do not have a planet to live on. Um, and so I think it's, you know, this is, it's the clock is ticking. Um, and and in, in so many ways, you know, there are so many issues that are worth fighting for and that, you know, people are fighting for. But all of those issues in some way, shape, or form connect to climate and connect to the place that we live and the planet that we live on. And so if we're not protecting the planet, then, then we won't have time or space to, to protect anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indigenous youth have been extremely active for climate um, for a long time. You know, one of the things that woke me up to what was happening in Standing Rock was the young people who ran all the way from Standing Rock to Washington, D.C. to deliver that petition to stop the pipeline to the Army Corps of Engineers. Why do you think it is, and what does it mean to you, that the world was shaken awake by Greta, a white, young Swedish student, and hasn't heard the words of other young people of color and indigenous youth before? What, what, why do you think that is? Um, well, that's a lot to unpack in itself, right? Um, just the image of, you know, a little white girl um, coming to save the planet is a little harmful in itself, but it's also a relief to even see that um, the problem is being addressed. Um, I think the reason that people are taking um, Greta's words a little more seriously and are being a little more considerate about it is because, um, well, one, you know, she does have her own privileges um, being white. Um, you know, when people think of Native Americans, they think of like the mascots or they think of the spiritual native and the peaceful native. Um, but really, we've been battling these um, pipelines, these railroads since like the beginning of colonialism. And um, I think it kind of plays into the white savior complex of, um, you know, white people tend to think like we, or not to, not to generalize it, but we see that a lot of um, just, I guess, white people uh, will try to, you know, go to these what are seen as like third world countries or um, will try to like donate all this money and go and help these communities. But in actuality, we know how to take care of ourselves. And I think it's more of a systematic change that needs to happen. Um, and learning how to be in community rather than um, kind of just going in and stepping Charity. into communities. Yeah, exactly. So I feel like there needs to be kind of an allyship rather than uh, I'm going to go into this community and save you. Paternalism. Um, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so it's a bit touchy because we do need resources and we do need funds but we also know how to take care of ourselves. We've been doing it for so long and it's been through the impacts of colonialism that we've had to struggle so much. Um, and so, yeah, I think we just really need to start changing the gear of, you know, being against, e being against each other um, to dismantling s racist systems that are in place, dismantling white privilege, um, or not white privilege, um, <laughs> sorry, white supremacy. And, Same um, <laughs> I mean, pretty much. But, uh, <laughs> um, but really learning how to be allies with one another and be in good relation. Mm -hmm. um, we shouldn't have to be at each other's necks. It, it shouldn't be that way. Um, and we just need to move forward from there. And so I, I think it, when it comes to Greta, it is easier to digest because um, she's seeing it from you know a, a white person's perspective, and that's going to be a little more palatable to white people because they know where she's coming from. But if you talk about an indigenous person, there's going to be a lot of trauma that's um, coming from that kind of point of view that a lot of people can't relate to. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 a, such a complicated thing because it, you know, I think when there's a lot of I think especially in the U.S. where our movement, even compared to the youth climate movement in Europe, is so much more diverse. You know, is multiracial, intergenerational, geographically really diverse. You know, we're it's just lots of different types of people, mm -hmm. and so it's you know it's even different here than it is in Europe. But I think there is within the youth movement here. 
I don't, I, I, I'm afraid criticism is the wrong word, but I think, you know, there is um, sometimes a frustration with, with the personification of the youth movement into, you know, one person that doesn't necessarily represent who is being hit the worst or who should be having their story told. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what is often, um, you know, what, what is often conflicted there is that it has nothing to do with, with Greta, right? Greta is, you know, obviously a really great messenger and in herself, you know, is, is, is a great speaker and, um, very inclusive. Yeah. And yeah. is, you know, but I think the, the issue is more with the system and with the with the media and yeah. what the media has done to, to her. Yeah, and I yeah. think it's the exact same thing that we saw with the youth gun violence movement. That you know the media was focusing on a number of white young people from a privileged white community rather than you know the black and brown youth who were disproportionately affected by gun violence that have been fighting for this for years and years. Yeah. And so you know we have to ask why why is the you know why why is Greta and why are the Parkland students and you know why am I or other you know white youth often and you know the ones who are centered when it shouldn't be us you know it should be black and brown youth it should be indigenous youth that are you know the ones who are front and center and so I think the critique should never be put on her and it yeah. should never be made to be that it is her mm -hmm. fault or her responsibility but it is that of the media and mm -hmm. that of um, I think the you know the system that mm -hmm. the system is not designed for you know indigenous youth to be the ones that rise to the top and get their voice heard otherwise we'd be in a very different place mm -hmm. um, and so I think that you know, so much of what we want to do with the movement, especially in the U.S., is that we're not trying to create a movement that we have one figurehead or a couple of figureheads right. because that's not a sustainable movement. Yeah. Sustainable movements are movements that come from the grassroots, are decentralized, are distributed, and that's what's being created right now here. Mm -hmm. And that's the power. Is it, It's not a leaderless movement, it's a leaderful movement. Mm -hmm. And so Greta is one of those leaders, mm -hmm. and B is one of those leaders, and you know, so many other young people who are coming from all different communities are those leaders across the country, and that's what makes our movement really powerful. And once the media can tell that story, I I think it's going to be even more impactful and reach even more people. Beautifully said. Um, the climate movement in the U.S. and around the world has changed a lot in the last year or so. Um, how do you notice the changes? What do you feel those changes are? Well, I think it's just um, becoming more addressed because it's more noticeable now. Um, I think that's to start with. You know, at first it was called like global warming. And people were like, oh, how is the you know, earth going to heat up? It didn't make sense. And now we're changing um, the language to make it more palatable for everybody, but also mm -hmm. to really make it, um, I guess, more understanding for everyone, right? You have to think, like, if you talk about climate change to one group of people, like, another group might not understand that. Um, but at the same time, like, now we're starting to see the outcomes slowly roll in. Like, just look at the fires in Australia, mm. you know, that's something that you can't run away from and you can't really blame it on anything else other than, you know, human affected climate change. Um, and I mean, aside from it being kind of tossed in our faces now, we're starting to see that um, the faces of the movement, I guess, are changing. They're becoming a little more diverse. We're starting to have more awareness about black and brown um, leadership, black and brown um, voices, and how they've been affected over the years. Um, so I, you know, it's going the right way. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, but it's, you know, crawling its way up. And, you know. I don't, what, how do you answer that question? I would say, I think going off your point about Australian fires is really interesting, because I think something that we talk about in like movement spaces is that, you know, when there are these like big movement moments, like, you know, the Women's March, like, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, like, um, you know, March for Our Lives, all of these come from trigger moments, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Women's March, for example, Trump got elected, March for Our Lives, the Parkland shooting. But for climate, there isn't, you know, there's not a trigger moment. There's not one huge thing, you know, it didn't all come from the Australian fires. But what it is, is these tiny trigger moments that happen, that is the fires here in California, is the flooding in the Midwest, is the hurricanes in Houston, you know, all of these things start to add up. And so these are like these tiny trigger moments that build and build and build. And I think that's one of the reasons that this movement is so much more sustainable. I think one of the things that I've seen over the last year that's changed is that, I think when we were going into the strikes on September 20th, we didn't know, 
we didn't know if it was just going to be one of these big protests and then the momentum would die. We didn't know if we were going to be able to continue it. And what has struck me is that we have only become even more powerful since mm -hmm. September 20th. Mm -hmm. And as we head toward Earth Day, as we head toward the election, I think we're going to, the public is going to start to really understand and see that. Um, but we've really just gotten started, which I think is, is, is exciting and, and scary. Um, but I think is, yeah, definitely something that we've seen over the last few months. Mm -hmm. Something that has moves me <laughs> that, that I didn't really realize until we began doing the fire drill Fridays in D.C. and so many young people came and spoke and they were, they were mostly young people of color but there were also some working class white people from inner cities. They're, in, they're grieving. There's such a deep sadness. And it didn't, I didn't realize, I mean, it's your future, I'll be dead. But it's your future that you're seeing unraveling before your eyes. And so many young people now who are doing what you did, you know, instead of going right to, to Stanford the way she could have, she's taking two years off to work to organize against the climate change. There were so many young people who came to Fire Drill Fridays who were just dropping everything that they had planned to do in their lives to sp fight for the Green New Deal. I really f I felt that in a lot of cases, the fact that there is now this vision, this framework for us mm -hmm. to look at what the future could be that has motivated a lot of young people to say, this is worth putting everything else down and fighting for. Does this resonate with you? Definitely. I think um, I think the media tends to romanticize youth activism. It's, you know, I think we've done it, we do it for all sorts of movements all around the world, but you know, I think I saw it especially during the you know March for Our Lives. We're seeing it again during climate that it's like, oh my gosh, these kids are so amazing. They're out here, you know, you know, fighting and organizing, and and it's like, we shouldn't have to be doing this. Like, this should not be our responsibility. You know, I, I'm I'm 20, so I'm like old compared to a lot of the young people that I work with, and I'm on phone calls with you know, you know. 16 year olds that are in that are you know in school all day also part of their school newspaper and directing their school play and at nighttime they're like organizing for climate and it's like yes it's amazing and and of course we will do it because we have to but we shouldn't be romanticizing we shouldn't be putting this on this pedestal and and you know saying oh these kids are so amazing it's adults should be listening and showing up which i think is why it's so great of what you are doing is that you're, you're you're saying that you're saying you know this shouldn't be left up to the kids the kids are kids we should be you know getting a childhood and and I think you know as as exciting and amazing this movement is I think I see it all the time that you know th this work is hard this is, is taxing work and and you know for me I get to do it full time and I, I'm lucky enough to be able to do that but you know for so many kids it's they're sacrificing so much and it's and it's you know they're they're forced to grow up so quickly and 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 it in in, in many levels I think it's it's really unfair and yeah. it's necessary and we have to do it and and we all have to play our part but I think it's it's often it's unfair yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. I'm glad that you mentioned that because there's a tendency among older people to think, well, you know, who wouldn't want to be protesting rather than being in school? But all the young people that I know who are part of the Friday, Friday for Future school strikes, it, you're right. It's a sacrifice. It's hard. They're usually quite smart and they want to get good grades and they want to do well and their teachers are mad at them and it's a sacrifice for them to leave school and do that. And I don't think people realize. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> um, I can definitely speak for the late night conversations that we have. <laughs> um, the dark circles that come on uh, onto our faces after, you know, we're doing finals and um, just trying to keep our lives together and it's it is a lot um, especially being a youth who's trying to figure out who you are mm -hmm. your role in the world um, what like we're gifted this huge task to figure out what we're supposed to do with our lives at such a young age and I think now with social media we've become so exposed to everything going on around the world we feel like we have to take on everything and it's very hard to swallow um, and to piggyback what you are saying, what you're saying is we shouldn't be doing this. Youth are not disposable. Um, 
you know, we have lives to live too and we have to work and go to school and there's points where I was working two jobs and going to school full time and, you know, I was still out here. I just started joining, I guess, the climate strike movement in um, late November and I remember getting off work at like 10 o'clock at night and hopping onto phone calls and writing emails and, you know, I shouldn't have to be the only one doing this, especially black and brown people. Like we've been doing this our whole lives, um, especially just constantly trying to struggle to survive in LA <laughs> alone is pretty hard um, but we do understand the importance of our roles in this and it's kind of the feeling of like if I don't do it I can't trust that someone else is going to do it because we've seen before that it can get out of hand and the people in office who are making these opinions are um, or just these decisions are white they're older they're going to die and we're going to have to live through their decisions and they're not and so um it is a lot to swallow um, and it can be very depressing. But I think um, just knowing that other youth are helping and um, we've kind of created like this community amongst ourselves has really been able to like help us and just navigate through whatever we have. And, um, and it kind of ties into the idea of, um, I guess, colonialism through the climate movement. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that everyone is pushing themselves and we need to learn that rest is resistance because if you don't take care of yourself first, how are you going to even take care of the planet? How are you going to take care of like your jobs and your school? And now you're seeing kids who are trying to balance SATs with like their classwork and um, coming to these strikes and it can be very detrimental. Um, but at the same time, you know, our parents push for it because it's going to look good on a resume or it's going to look good on this and that but we shouldn't be out here doing this all the time. We have lives to live, like I said, and so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it can be a lot. How, how important to both of you is the existence of a Green New Deal? <laughs> um, I think coming from an indigenous background, um, until I start seeing the decolonization of um, the states, until I start seeing indigenous sovereignty, um, going into practice, I don't think I would be comfortable with anything, but I do understand the importance of a Green New Deal. Um, and that kind of goes, it's going to sound weird, <laughs> I, that kind of goes into my belief of um, being an indigenous um, woman and um, I guess like binary fluid person um, into the idea that I also don't call myself a feminist because, you know, as an indigenous person, my nation, we were matriarchal. We already had the idea that, you know, women and two-spirit people um, already had the system and role where we were in charge and, um, you know, we were on councils and we got to pick out, you know, who we thought was best and who, you know, we thought wasn't the best and we had the power to remove them. And there was this equal balance um, amongst our nations and amongst our people where we didn't need feminism. But I can definitely see now that, um, for example, in like white culture, like you don't really have anything like that to model off of. So, um, you know, I can see where feminism does need a role to play in. And um, same thing for the climate movement. Um, we already had coexisting like lifestyles with, with our earth, um, with our unchimaka, with our mother. Um, that now there needs to be policies in a place where you know the guidelines will show you how to live so like i said <laughs> until i start seeing um, indigenous sovereignty and really a serious relationship with the earth um, i don't think i could be comfortable but i think it's definitely a new start mm -hmm. beautiful answer how about you i think I, what i really like about the green jail as you said is it gives people something tangible, something to sink their teeth into and say, you know, we're not just fighting against this thing, we're not just fighting against this, you know, idea of, of destruction and, and the planet burning, but we're actually fighting for something and that the climate that climate change really provides us an opportunity to rebuild our society and rebuild it to be one that centers justice and equity. Um, I think what I really love where the movement is going is that we're moving away from, you know, just talking about the Green New Deal as AOC's Green New Deal, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in Congress, but talking about it as a framework of thinking. You know, yeah. the Green New Deal was based off the New Deal, and the New Deal wasn't, you know, one resolution, it was a set of policies. And so that's, I think, how we can view the Green New Deal. And, and in the strike movement, we're starting to talk about it as, as the era of the Green New Deal. 
do. You know, 2020 is, is, is the first year in the decade of the Green New Deal, and it's a new era. So, you know, for the climate strikes, for the national climate strikes demands, um, for, for Earth Day, for the Earth Day strikes, um, you know, we talk about we, our top line messaging is where we're demanding a transition to an era of a Green New Deal, and that means, and then we list demands, and the number one demand is respect for or, um, indigenous rights and sovereignty, which is because that, you know, is something that I think has been has been left out in some ways of, of the Green New Deal. And so we must emphasize it. We must we must make people understand that, you know, the Green New Deal isn't just about, um, you know, um, you know th that one resolution, but it's a framework of how we're going to make this transition. And we're going to make it transition in centering those who are hit first and worst by the climate crisis and make sure that, you know, we're not just saying, okay, like no more and moving on, but we're ensuring that there are good jobs, good paying jobs, um, and, that, and that we see justice for indigenous people, we see justice for black and brown people, um, because that is what is going to be needed if we're really going to make the transition that is going to put us back on, on the track yeah, to, yeah, to protect yeah. our planet. And I just want to emphasize that, that those values, it's not just because it's the right thing to do morally. It's strategically it's necessary, necessary yes. if we're going to save the planet. You know, I'm, I've been studying what's happening with forests, and the research shows that in forests where indigenous communities are living and uh, being allowed to do what they do, which is to protect and stu steward the forests, that's where the forests are healthy. And when you destroy those indigenous communities or deprive them of their rights, that's where the forests begin to, to disintegrate. And the forests are central to the survival of humans so, and our ability to breathe and have oxygen and so forth. So it's a very strategic thing to, to and besides, indigenous peoples are the ones that have been putting their bodies on the lines. Have you heard about the big victory in northern Alberta? Yes, I oh have. Oh, my so. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, I'm going to be honest, it's very, very tiresome going to marches, going to have to, you know, take up space. And especially for, our, like, our elders, um, especially, like, when doing land acknowledgments, it can be a lot. Um, you know, we only have, like, in Los Angeles, a few elders that actually come out and do these events, and they come, they look for, you know, parking, and they have to pay for it, and then, um, you know, walk out to the event, and they go and, like, spend, like, five minutes, and then they have to, like, go home, you know. And um, that's why I've been kind of also emphasizing the importance of um, giving, like, stewards of the land also time to speak as well, instead of just having them come out, um, because they shouldn't have to be doing this. <laughs> um, it can, like, they have lives too. They have work and um, their kids go to school and so forth. And so it's just, it, it can be a lot um, on our lives. And um, especially in terms of, like, I think the importance of, um, like paying youth for their time. Um, one thing that we say is that our, our words are medicine. Um, they can affect people in different ways and the way that um, we deliver our words can have a huge impact. Um, and so it's just as important to understand that, you know, youth could be doing other things too, that, you know, our time should be valued as well, um, especially indigenous youth, uh, to emphasize the importance that, um, we're, we're tired. <laughs> we're tired and we deserve to be to be paid we, or at least compensated. Um, the way that I was raised is that when, you know, someone comes into your house, you offer them food, you offer them water, you offer them a place to stay. And um, that's traditionally how we've kept things and, you know, being hospi uh, hospitable people, um, that's the way it should be carried out. And so, yeah. <laughs> so. Well said. What do you both want the people that are watching to know, I mean, I don't know exactly when they're going to be watching, but let's just say that people are watching before Earth Day. What do you want people to know they should do during those days that the students are striking? Yeah, definitely. I can talk a little bit about the, the national framework, and then if you want to talk specifically about Los Angeles. Um, so first, go to strikewithus.org uh, to find the... S say it again. Strikewithus.org. Strikewithus.org. And you can find the strike nearest to you um, on, on any of the three days. So um, the national framework is sort of a suggestion to folks locally, and then people are adopting it in different ways. But essentially, what it is is it's um, beginning on April 22nd, which is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, with the day of mass mobilization. 
again. Um, so this day is a day we're hoping to see millions of people out in the streets marching and rallying. This is also a day that we're really emphasizing indigenous leadership. Uh, as as a um, nationally, it's a goal of the Youth Coalition to um, uh, get, do a better job of um, uh, centering not just indigenous stories and voices, but actually indigenous leadership. And so this April 22nd is we're really emphasizing this piece of indigenous leadership. That's April 22nd. Um, April 23rd is a day of climate finance. So um, students across the country will be participating in actions on their college campuses, uh, demanding that their schools divest from fossil fuels. And then um, we'll also be seeing actions all across the country targeting uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, BlackRock, and Liberty Mutual, uh, which respectively are the bank, the asset manager, and the insurance company with the most money in fossil fuels. And then on Friday, we'll see a day of political action. So both actions targeting elected officials and government leaders, and then um, mass voter registration, which is really a central message to the, all, the strikes all three days is, mm -hmm. is, you know, the kids are striking for climate and they're asking you to vote. Um, so that's sort of the, the three-day structure, and we're going to see thousands of actions all over the country. We um, already have uh, many, and the map is going live soon, so we're really excited, and, and people can find their local strike at strikefest.org. Oh, right. Yeah, and then we can talk a little bit about how, how you all are adapting that for LA, which is amazing. <laughs> so it's been um, kind of a struggle trying to work with so many different organizations um, while trying to implement the idea of indigenous leadership. That's kind of a new um, idea, a new framework that's been going into play. Um, so instead of three days, um, the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, we wanted to do four days because, you know, that's how we do like rounds and ceremony. Um, and we do things in just the number four for the most part. Um, whether it be the four directions, the four um, prayers, um, whatever you have it be. Um, but in this case, it's going to be the 21st, uh, so the day before Earth Day, um, which will be a prayer for self. Um, we'll be doing a water ceremony um, at 4 p.m. Um, so that'll kind of give us the time to meet up at Venice, or I think we're meeting at 5. Um, sorry, uh, we'll be meeting at 5, and we're going to be meeting at Venice. Um, we'll be marching down to the beach um, and having about 30 to 40 minutes of silence, um, whether it be meditation or prayer, you know, just to really kind of emphasize the importance of going inward um, and that it's important to take care of yourself um, before going into these big things because it can be a lot. Um, and then the day, oh, also we'll be having um, a moment of silence. So for 15 minutes, wherever you are, um, to just kind of remain in silence for um, yourself, um, knowing that you could possibly be giving a lot to the movement and it can be very detrimental. So giving that inner peace to yourself, um, as well as all the people who have lost their lives, um, including missing and murdered indigenous relatives, um, and just all the people, all the um, indigenous folks who've lost their lives to the movement and um, you know, just doing their traditional job as being stewards of the land. Um, so coming Earth Day, um, the 22nd, we'll be doing um, a prayer for uh, the Earth. Um, so that'll be <laughs> Earth Day in itself, um, and that will be more so of like the mayhem, um, hi highlighting indigenous um, people like the Tongva um, of the land, as well as um, Simias. I don't know if you know the school. It's an indigenous school in LAUSD. Um, so they'll be doing danza. Um, and kind of just really bringing um, indigenous voices to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there it would be more partnership um, with our organizations that we're you know, in contact with, um, as well as giving them time to speak and you know, frontline communities, um, giving that, that place to really voice their um, opinions and their, um, just their whatever they have to get across. <laughs> um, and then th as for the day after, uh, the 23rd, It'll be looking more like a restful actions, and then I'll be a prayer for um, the seven generations. Um, that'll look like divesting from fossil fuels, from um, banks, from all these other um, corporations that are pretty much funding um, <laughs> the climate crisis. Uh, and so just kind of offering that space for, um, I guess what, what we've been calling it is mayhem, <laughs> is di uh, really disrupting um, these banks from. Uh, you it's know, called good trouble. Money. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, that's um, the 23rd, and then as for the 24th, um, 
we want to be in recognition that it's um, a day of Ramadan mm -hmm. um, as well as the Armenian Genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to be putting our prayers towards the communities and being good relatives. Um, but in terms of the International Indigenous Youth Council, we want to um, hold a feast or a feed for everyone. Um, we're kind of thinking potluck style. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit big um, because we want to open it up to the public. We don't want it to be, you know, just the organizers or, you know, just a specific group of people. Um, all these people have been coming out and really supporting us and putting their um, putting their bodies on the line. And so, you know, in our traditional ways, we offer food um, as like a form of prayer and a form of respect. And so that's something that we want to do for our community. Mm -hmm. So, Thank yeah. you. Great. Um, and what is the climate strike movement doing to encourage people to vote in November? That is central to the strategy this year. Um, essentially, the idea is that we, you know, we saw in 2018, the midterm elections, that issue-based voting was really powerful for young people. So voting around the issue of gun violence was super effective to turning out young people. We had a historic turnout in 2018 for 18 to 29-year-olds. So we're doing again in 2020, but for climate. Um, and so the message this year really is, you know, the kids are striking for climate. They're asking you to vote. Um, we are building up our infrastructure on the climate strikes leading up to Earth Day. Um, and really starting to plant this seed with organizers all across the country. And then as soon as Earth Day is done, we're going to convert the infrastructure around the climate strikes into voting, um, into voting infrastructure so that we are seeing a historic turnout of young people um, and all people who are voting because they care about the planet and they care about our lives and our futures. Uh, and so we're really excited. We have um, lots of fun for on the organizer side. We have lots of fun messaging and tools and um, and, and trainings that we're doing. And then um, we're really hoping that that message breaks through in the story and the media story that mm -hmm. um, you know this is not this is not just about putting your you know bodies into the street, but it's really about using your vote at the polling booths as well. Is there going to be an emphasis on college campuses getting college students? They, well, you go to college at about 17, right? So they can vote. Yes. 18. Yeah, usually kids turn from 17 to 18 their senior in high school. And so what's really nice is that the uh, strikes are in the spring, so a lot of seniors in high school will be 18. And so the focus is a lot of voter registration in high school and then also on college campuses yeah. as well. That's great. Mm -hmm. How can adults be the best allies to young people and to indigenous people as the leaders of this movement? <laughs> Start with um, so I have been kind of um, telling adults in this case um, that youth, especially black and brown um, youth, don't need parents. We need resources and we, we need mentors. Um, we have parents at home. We don't need these kind of mother birds hovering over us telling us what to do. Um, like I said, mentoring is also a good thing, like kind of pointing us in the direction that we need to go. But bottom line, like I think because we've been so exposed to everything that's going on in the world, um, we kind of have a very good idea of filtering out um, I guess what would be called like fake news, as well as being able to really sit down and listen to what our other community members have to say, um, as well as the understanding that um, adults need to teach empowerment. Um, empowerment does not look like, I mean, you could give people funds that I mean, works perfectly, but at the same time, <laughs> funds, F-U-N-D-S, <laughs> funds, funds, yeah, money. So, mon yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yes, you can, yeah. you we, can give we us. We appreciate money. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely appreciate money, but also teach us how to write grants. Yeah. Teach us how to, okay. you know, work for our money. So we're not scraping for all these other companies and organizations um, to look for money. It can be really tiresome, and um, grant writing is a skill that you can take everywhere. It's a portable skill, so. Um, really teaching youth how to navigate um, systems that aren't meant for um, black and brown youth um, and just youth in general to succeed um, is really going to help us. <laughs> and is that already happening to some extent? <laughs> to some extent, um, it has been. In my, in my organization specifically, we've been trying to learn how to write grants um, on our own, which is very scary. <laughs> so you're not being mentored then? No. Um, I think for indigenous youth, our mentors are our elders. Um, and I say elders um, in terms of uh, members um, who are older in our who are older in our community that we get to decide who elders are. It's a title that's definitely earned, um, not <laughs> just someone who's older. Um, and we have the utmost respect for our elders in our community as well as our youth. Um, 
especially like our two-spirit um, women are the backbones, our mothers are the backbones of our communities. So we really, I've always looked to um, my aunties, um, to the elders in my community for help. They usually know how to navigate all of this stuff, um, especially when it comes to organizing. I can just look up at um, what's with 10. You know, they've been, um, <laughs> going, doing so much, including like blockades, um, chaining themselves to police cars, and you know it's not our first rodeo. <laughs> 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 so um, I think when it comes down to it, we need mentors um, and people who are going to teach us how to navigate the systems that aren't meant for us. Mm -hmm. So you specifically mentioned um, grant writing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm hoping that there are people watching who. <laughs> we will want to volunteer. <laughs> so get, be specific about what other things besides grant writing. Empowerment also looks like being able to, you know, step aside and bring up a youth voice. Uh -huh. um, I feel like, so I actually have a history of working um, with the Department of Public Health in Los Angeles County um, on their youth council. And one thing that I got from adults is that they're very scared of working with youth. They don't, they don't know how to talk to youth, and it's very much a, gener a generational gap. Mm -hmm. um, but learning how to put your fears aside and close that gap and really take the time to listen, not hear us, listen to us, um, is something that can be very useful. And I think youth are so trained to have to listen to every single thing that comes out of an adult's mouth that um, we feel like we don't have voices and if anything you know sometimes we can see like youth being punished for speaking out or um, kind of being joked at and um, it can be it can cause very serious mental health issues um, being filled like you don't have a voice um, which can be a privilege in itself but you know as youth we we just really want someone to listen to us mm -hmm. to what we have to say as well mm -hmm. How about you, Katie? Yeah, I think I really like how you framed it. I think that like the 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 true power, and we saw this for September 20th, because September 20th was really globally the first intergenerational strike. It was the first strike that people, that young people asked adults to show up for. And I think what we saw in the US was this, you know, coalition forming both with youth and adults um, that brought together, you know, the energy and the passion and the media spotlight that young people have with the resources and the knowledge and the experience that adults have and that the adult-led movement has. And those two things together are so, so power, powerful. That collective power is, is really what made us, I think, so effective. But I think the, you know, how we've set up nationally the, the coalition structure that plans the climate strikes is so that we center the youth, that they're, you know, the ones who are doing the strategy, are doing the messaging, are creating the vision, and then we're asking adults to show up, to back us up, you know, to bring the, the operations. Um, and I think that that is, you know, what I hope that we can start to see this movement develop even more is that, you know, the young people and, and especially our indigenous young people, you know, they know the direction that this movement needs to go in. They know, you know, where we need to get to. And so the best role for adults is just to help us get there, is to show up, is to say, how can I help? Um, you know, I think on a very hyper local level, I think it oftentimes is making the food or driving people around or, um, you know, printing posters or whatever it might be. But mm -hmm. that's a really important thing. You know, mm -hmm. we need that support. Um, and so I really think it is, you know, for me, it comes down to adults need to show up. They need to show up for young people physically, emotionally, mentally, um, you know, online, offline. They need to be showing up and they need to be supporting young people. They need to be using their vote to protect young people. Yeah. Um, and they need to be using their voice to protect young people. I was very Absolutely. proud that Greenpeace gave uh, a big chunk of money to the youth climate strikers in, 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 in New York yes. that are going to be doing a big action there on yeah. yeah, I should, there is, so um, the National Coalition has the Youth Climate Action Fund, which is a shared fund that all the youth-led organizations, part of the National Coalition, together oversee that grant out to strikes across the country. So for September 20th, we granted out um, almost $200,000. We have a goal of raising $1 million for that fund for Earth Day. Mm -hmm. And folks can donate to that fund by going to strikethefts.org. Um, and, and that is something that really Say helps. it again. St say it again. You can donate to the Youth Climate Action Fund by going to strikewithus.org. And that is a place that supports young people who are doing work all across the country. So that's yeah. a really great fund. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot to unpack. Um, <laughs> but and there's there's so many different levels of um, just between uh, intersectionality that we could address just in the climate movement in itself. Um, but yeah, just showing up is now, a huge flesh thing. Flesh that out. What you meant. Intersectionality. Uh, yes. Um, so intersection in the climate movement. In the climate movement. So. It's the different 
faces that you see um, in the climate movement, whether it be um, disabled folks, whether it be colored folks, whether it be the different genders, whether it be like there's so many identities um, that kind of cross between each other and um, that are willing to represent themselves um, to stand out in the movement that we really need to address and just talk to. And um, that's really a big thing in the movement is just talking to people and understanding where they're coming from, their backgrounds, um, their privileges. And um, I feel like that's a new thing too is privilege has been kind of used as a bad word. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as my understanding, it can definitely be used as a tool, and I think we need to learn how to utilize that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> Even for adults, if that means, you know, being older than 18, coming out and supporting your votes for youth. You know, if your child says, oh, go vote for, go vote for Bernie or whoever, you know, if they seem fit that this is going to benefit them, then do so. Like, <laughs> there's so many different things that adults could do. We don't know who's going to be the Democratic nominee. Um, I, I know that uh, young people are tending to support Bernie. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if Bernie does not get the nomination, mm -hmm. that those young people who can vote will vote for whoever the nominee is? Or is it Bernie or bust? I think that, you know, what, how I explain it is that, you know, Bernie, I think the reason so many young people are, are drawn toward Bernie is that, you know, the movement is behind Bernie. And Bernie will bring us the revolution. That's what he's promising. You know, he's not running to beat Trump. He's running to create a revolution. And I think that that's why so many young people are, are gravitate th toward that. Because we look at the world around us and we realize that, we need a revolution. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. um, we need a climate revolution. You know, we need someone that's going to say on day one that climate is a number one priority. That's what Bernie is saying he's going to do. You know, that's what his he's running on is climate, and that's why I think young people are gravitating toward him is because, you know, he's promising not just to be Trump but to actually do something. Yeah. And I think you know. Joe Biden, who is, you know, the other one, is um, running to beat Trump. And so that's really important. And so if, you know, if it's not Bernie, we still have to vote for Biden because Biden is still the only other option besides Trump. And Trump is very, very bad. I was on a, a phone call yesterday with, you know, climate strike leaders from across the world. And one of the climate strikers from Canada said, you know, if Trump wins again, we will not, we will not see 1.5 degrees. We won't make it. We will not make it. And Globally, we know that. So as young people in the United States, we have a responsibility to the rest of the world to vote out Trump, even if it means we don't get our rev revolution right now. Trump is, is, you know, is, is, is an anti-revolution and, and, you know, Biden is at least neutral and, and, and can bring people, can develop a team that, that we can hold accountable, that we can make demands to. Trump is not going to listen to us. He's clearly not listening to us. And, mm -hmm. and we can still make, a, we can still make demands of, of a Biden, of a Biden um, White House. You know, mm -hmm. we, we can hold them accountable in a way that we cannot do with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Bernie's promising the revolution, but, but Biden is better than Trump. And so, you know, if it's not Bernie, it, we will, we must show up. Mm -hmm. and, and then we also must show up for others. We must show up for Senate races, for local races, for state legislators, because we need to see action at every level. And especially if we don't have a, you know, a commander in chief who, who is going to, to push that forward, we need governors, we need you know, senators, we need representatives that are. And so it's so important that young people vote no matter what. You know, we cannot see a repetition of 2016, this Bernie or right. bust that cannot happen. Yeah. And, and our futures are literally relying on that. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm so glad to hear you <laughs> say that. And also, I think it's important to talk about voting down ballot. Yeah. Which isn't happening enough. Pe you know, people yeah. have to really hear what you just said. And it's not just senators and, and representatives in the House. It's boards of supervisors. Yeah. It's state legislatures. Yeah, it's city councils. Yeah. It's all, Absolutely. you know, the city council of Los Angeles, if they weren't so full of developers, could put Los Angeles on the path of a Green New Deal, which means we have to vote for good people for city council. I mean, they're, it's all so important. And one of the things that's really interested me is to find out that the scientists, who are usually, you know, very kind of below the radar and trying to be neutral, and they're now coming out and saying we have to, the only way we're going to do this is to mobilize in unprecedented numbers. In other words, 
Earth Day and the student activities that are going to be going on those days. It's so important that we put bodies in the streets. Mm -hmm. It's like a rehearsal because when the time comes to force whoever gets elected to do the right thing, it's going to take many yeah. millions of people in the streets forcing them. And so we have to get used to doing that. Marching, protesting, engaging in civil disobedience, all those things, right? Absolutely. And I think the other thing too that adults need to realize is that youth are protesting because we have to. Like, we know that we have to. Um, we go to school, we work jobs too, and just the adults need to realize like, if we're doing this, you need to do this even more so. And even if that means, you know, having to take a vacation off, which, I mean, it depends on each person because you have to realize too that a lot of black and brown people can't take a day off. They can't afford that. Um, so that's also, I think, a challenge that we've had to face mm -hmm. is how are we going to make this more approachable for the working class? Um, because we just cannot afford to be missing days. We can't afford to, you know, be taking time off. Um, but at the same time, like, it needs to be a big like kind of outcome um, to really show you know support for for our earth and yeah. um, for all the policies that we want to push yeah you know this is a shout out for health care universal health care for everybody we in the United States are at a big disadvantage because if you go on a protest or you engage in civil disobedience and you lose your job, you lose your health care yeah. whereas in other countries you don't your health care isn't job dependent you know? So that's one reason to fight for you. <laughs> yeah, amongst many. Amongst <laughs> Among many, many. Yes. yeah. Is there anything in conclusion that you want to say to the, to the people that are, that are watching? Strike with us and vote with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, just listening to us here is taking one big step mm -hmm. um, into guiding yourself into how to help us. And um, your support is unbelievable. And, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for watching, and uh, you can follow Fire Drill Fridays uh, on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, but if you want to get involved, if you want to find out where there's going to be a Fire Drill Friday action, or if you want information about how to start a Fire Drill Friday where you live, then you can text Jane at 877-877. Thank you for watching, and thank you, too, so much for being part of this teach-in. Thanks. Thank you. For Thank us. you.